On December 10, 2021, tragedy struck the Magad family in the tiny town of Mimi, Philippines, when Louis and Wen Magad fell victim to a brutal crime. Amidst the grief, an adopted daughter named Janice emerged as the sole survivor. Unraveling a complex tale of deception and trauma, this narrative delves into the shocking events that forever altered the lives of the Magad family and the town they called home. The cops have given Lavella Magad permission to deal with the aftermath of a horrible crime that killed her children. When she cleans the rooms that used to be happy but are now sad, she cannot help but think of times when she was happy, safe, laughing, and comfortable. The brutal killing of her two children leaves a dark shadow over Lavella's daily life. She turns to her adopted daughter Janice, who miraculously lived, to find comfort in the horror. New clues, like an odd ID card, help the investigation go further and reveal a dark plan behind the terrible events of December 10, 2021. On September 22, 2013, a long time before what happened at the Magad home, a nine-year-old girl stood on the dock and looked hopelessly into the water. She could not handle the lack of parental love and care, poverty, beatings, and physical hunger. A busy woman stopped to look at a quiet, lonely child. The girl looked up when asked why she was here by herself and if she needed help. She said quietly, My name is Janice Stavo. I do not have any parents. I do not remember anything. According to the woman, the child had some kind of shock that made her forget things. She might have been through a terrible thing. The woman took the girl to the police station nearby and was told that the child would be cared for. People took Janice temporarily into their care while they looked for her parents. The search went on for a while but never found anything. The girl had forgotten everything about her life. No one ever reported the child missing, and after a while, the girl was officially recognized as an orphan and sent to the Department of Social Welfare and Development to live with them permanently. This did not bother the child at all. She had enough food, clothes, and adult attention for the first time. Janice didn't forget her past. Her young mind, shaped by tough experiences, simply hid memories of home and family. Faced with a chaotic upbringing, Janice instinctively chose to embark on a fresh start leaving behind the hardships for the prospect of a better life. This coping mechanism illustrated the resilience of a child navigating adversity. Even in those early years, Janice displayed an intuitive understanding of how to engage with others in a way that elicited support. Her ability to win people over and seek assistance marked the beginning of her journey toward a new, improved life. This revelation unveils the complexities of Janice's past, highlighting the adaptive nature of a child's mind in the face of challenging circumstances and emphasizing the enduring strength that propelled her toward a brighter future. The events of 2013 were not a one-time pass to a new life, but rather a way for her to get what she wanted. People knew Cruz and Lavella Magad as a married couple. Cruz helped run an elementary school while his wife taught at the nearby high school. They had two great kids together. Gwen, who was 18 years old and very smart, took part in all kinds of events outside of school and was a Girl Scout. The girl wanted to become a doctor and even went to a training medical school in her last year of high school to test herself. Louis, who was 16 years old, became the life of any group he joined. He was friendly and open, and he could play the guitar, sing, and paint. The young man was very responsible, liked helping everyone, and wanted to do well in law school. Parents were proud of their kids, always there for them, and backed up their plans and goals. The family lived a moderate life. They went to church and helped others. She met Janice at one of the church's charity events, where she was there to watch the kids. The girls became best friends right away. They were funny and cool and they were about the same age. They used TikTok to post dance videos and thought of fun things to do in their spare time. Louis liked taking part in their events. When Janice's brother and sister asked her why she was not in school, she told them that she was an orphan and that her parents had died when she was very young from illness, so she has been dependent on government aid since she was a kid. To get something for herself, she has to work part-time instead of going to school. After that, Janice told her new friends over and over again about her worries about the future. She is about to turn 18, which means she will lose some government perks that are only for kids. 
she might not even have enough money to pay for her rent. People almost never think about getting an education or a good job. Gwen felt better when she saw how bad things were for her friend, so she decided to help her and went to her parents. She told them about a new friend whose life was hard and tragic, and she asked them to adopt Janice so that she could have a place to live and learn. She told the parents that everything would be okay. This would allow Janice to go to school, share chores, and help Louie with his homework. Initially, the Magods were uncertain. As teachers with low income, they struggled to afford another child. Plus, they did not have any extra space in their house for Janice. Louis chose to sleep on the couch in the living room instead of his own bed. The parents finally gave in because their daughter and son kept asking them to. The Magad family officially adopted Janice in July 2021. She went to school with them and even took their last name. Janice was smart and nice, as it turned out. She agreed to follow the house rules. Cruz and Lavella wanted their kids to be obedient adults who knew how important it is to work hard and save their money. So they brought them into the house. Janice, her sister, and her brother all had the same amount of chores to do. The girl did her part of the work happily and always showed her foster parents respect. Expressing gratitude for her newfound family, Janice would occasionally prepare breakfast for everyone early in the morning. The couple realized that in assisting Janice as Gwen had requested, they not only helped the girl but also gained a second daughter. Janice even went on to affectionately refer to them as mom and dad at one point. At 2.58 p.m. on December 10, 2021, Cruz was looking over his middle school homework when he got a call from a neighbor who quickly told him to go home and not to worry. Janice posted something strange on Facebook ahead of time. Your house appears to have been burglarized. Cruz stopped what he was doing at work, called his wife, who was also at work at the time, and ran home. He tried to call his kids on the way, but they did not answer. The worried dad drove home very fast because he cared more about his kids' safety than the money in the house. Cruz pulled up to the house around 3.15 in the afternoon. There was no key in the front door of the house, so he went to the back door and came in through a different entrance. It was a mess everywhere. Cruz called each child by name as he went from room to room. He saw something in the living room that no parent should ever see. Louis and Gwen were bloody and lying on the floor. In the living room, Louis was lying down with his hands tied behind his back and a towel in his mouth. He had scars all over his body. He found Gwen close to the bedroom door. She had cuts and blood all over her body. It was clear that they were dead. Cruz realized all of a sudden that there had to be a third person in the house when he heard a noise in his head. He screamed Janice over and over again. Suddenly, Cruz heard a voice say, Daddy. He turned around and was glad to see Janice alive. He hugged her and noticed that her hair was wet. Inquiring, he learned that she had just stepped out of the shower and hadn't heard his call due to the sound of running water. Her sad father thought her answer was strange, but he found out that Janice was trying to forget the horrible things that had happened to her. Having checked to see if she was okay, the man called the cops. When the police got there, they saw a broken wine bottle, a baseball bat, a hammer, and a knife nearby. Most of the time, having more than one way to commit a crime means there are more than one criminals. The police expecting to find fingerprints on these items gave them to the right officers and then searched the house and gathered evidence near and around it. They told Cruz and Lavella to look at the things very carefully to see what was missing. The police carefully interviewed Janice, who was the only person who made it out alive. Someone screamed and fought. She explained that she and Gwen were in one room and Lewis was in the living room. When she and Gwen went to see what was going on right away, they saw three masked thieves hitting Lewis with a hammer, a baseball bat, and a knife. They scared each other so badly with what they saw that they let out a silent scream. One of the bad guys ran after Gwen. It sounds like he did not notice Janice. She was so shocked that she did not dare to move. Before she lost her cool, she texted her mother to ask for help, but her mother did not answer. Afraid of giving herself away by ringing or speaking, she did not call the cops. It took her 12 minutes to write two pleas for help on Facebook. Help. There are strangers in my house. I can only hide in my room right now. I do not want to die. A neighbor saw one of the posts and called Cruz. 
Three days after the horrible event, the Philippine police put together a special investigation team of the best staff and experts. The investigation team said on December 15th that they had gathered a lot of evidence and clues and that the case is now being classed as a murder and theft case. But they do not rule out other versions and they will look into other ideas in more depth. The people on the research team thought Janice was the main person involved in the crime. Experts looked at evidence from the crime scene and witness statements against Janice's. They found several big differences that led them to think she might have been involved instead of being a witness. First, there was nothing missing from the house which did not make sense if the three thieves were going to rob it. Cruz and Lavella said that even though the house was upside down, all the belongings and money were still there. Only Gwen's cell phone was not there. Second, the police found bloody pants and a shirt in a plastic bag in a pond close to Cruz's house. It was proven that the blood on the clothes came from the guys who were killed. It looked like the killer or one of the killers changed into clean clothes after the crime and then ran away. In other words, he was remarkably calm after committing the crime which shows that he had thought about it and planned it. If there were multiple deaths during a failed robbery, the thief would have probably become scared and tried to escape as quickly as possible instead of taking the time to find clean clothes and change them. Especially since the parents did not say that any clothes were missing and the killer probably would not have thrown the bloody clothes into the stream behind the house. Also, there were clues at the scene that pointed to an emotional crime rather than a cold-blooded one. The bodies of the brother and sister had too many cuts and broken bones. Someone even cut off one of Gwen's ears. The wounds on her face were the worst. It took two whole days to do the exam. It looks more like someone is releasing their anger or jealousy in this scene than they are trying to figure something out. The person who did it was clearly very angry. The nature of the crime made it clear that it was a killing for personal reasons. Third, the forensic medical report said that the older sister died before the younger boy, which was different from what Janice said. She said that the younger brother was attacked first. With all the wounds Janice talked about, it was impossible that he could have lived longer than his sister, who had been bleeding for a long time. Also, the murder tools belonged to the family. The bad guys did not bring them with them. Everyone in the family owned the hammer, which he kept in the laundry room drawer. Cruz was sure that his two oldest daughters, Gwen and Janice, were the only ones who knew where the hammer was kept. The parents said that the baseball bat that was found at the scene belonged to their youngest son and that he kept it on the second level of the bed under a blanket. When burglars are caught in the act, they do not search the house for a hammer and bat that they have hidden somewhere. They either bring their own murder tools or use things that are around. The two most important tools for the crime were only known to the people who lived in the house. Because Cruz and Lavella had other stories to tell, Janice was the only one who knew where the hammer and baseball bat were kept. She knew where the strange thing was because Louis let her stay in his room. Because the killer was not alone, she was probably with them, even if she was not the killer. Fifth, Lavella got a text message from Janice asking for help. She called Janice right away, but she did not answer. After some time, she said that she had written a Facebook post because her mother had not replied. Data from dispatch confirmed Lavella's call. It did not seem like the person who wrote the long Facebook post with all the emojis would be afraid to even move. There are a few confusing parts to Janice's story. When she got scared, it's odd that instead of calling the police, she took a shower. Usually, it's not safe to be in the shower when you're scared because it's hard to hear if someone is coming. Even though Janice said she was scared of the three people, she still decided to take a shower and wash her hair. But if she was sure they were gone and didn't want to make noise, why didn't she call the police before taking a shower? It's a bit strange. Another thing is that the autopsy, which is a medical examination after death, showed that Gwen and Lewis died around 2 p.m. But Janice waited almost an hour before telling her foster mom and even longer before posting on Facebook. This makes the timing of her actions a bit confusing. The most puzzling part is that, despite the thieves searching everywhere in the small room, they didn't find Janice. It's hard to understand how she managed to stay hidden. These things make the whole story a bit complicated and it raises questions about what really happened. The investigation team already had the lab report when Lavelle walked into the police station with Merlin's ID. Investigators found Janice's prints on the murder tools, a hammer, and a baseball bat, 
Of course, the tools could have had the prints of anyone living in the house, but she was the most likely suspect because of the other red flags. It was official interview time for Janice at the station on December 18th. The person told her about the ID she had found, the forensic exam results, and all the things that did not make sense. Unexpectedly, Janice admitted to the crime right away, which shocked the police. She told them that she and Merlin had killed Lewis and Gwen. Soon after the statement, Janice and Merlin were both taken into custody. Finding Gwen's cell phone in the young man's things was the only thing that was missing from the crime scene. Two young guys were each charged with first-degree murder and jailed without bail. We still do not know how Janice and Merlin met or what kind of relationship they had. The only thing that is known is that Merlin was the same age as the girl and worked at the church getting things ready for services. They were Facebook friends. After reading their letters, police found out that they had been planning to kill Gwen and Lewis since December 1st. Cruz and Lavella were very upset and could not believe what was going on. Janice had always seemed very polite and quiet. It was kind of them to take her in and treat her like their own daughter. Their kids loved her like a sister. Why? What was her reason for doing that? She felt her family adopted her just to show they cared, taking advantage of her tough situation. It was like being picked up without much thought, similar to a stray dog. If aware of Janice's true sentiments, the family might have attempted to help her understand, but such efforts were absent. Janice skillfully veiled her emotions with finesse, preparing breakfast not out of gratitude, but from a sense of obligation. Her considerable resentment towards the extensive housework imposed by the family stemmed from her perception of them as hypocritical, treating her more like a servant than a daughter. As soon as the news of Janice's confession became known, there was an uproar in the town. All the residents could not believe that a 17-year-old orphan girl had committed such a brutal crime. People began to compare her to the heroine of the movie Orphan, because of which the number of adoptions had already dropped once. As the uproar continued to grow, the investigative team looked into Janice's past and found her mother and two younger brothers. Turns out Janice was not an orphan. When she was very young, her family lived in great poverty. Her father gambled and spent all the family money on gambling. The family was almost constantly starving. In 2013, the girl ran away from home. Standing on that pier, she accepted the help of a concerned woman. Out of desperation, having received food, care, and warmth almost for the first time in her life, she realized that the best solution would be never to remember her parents and brothers again. Her family was not looking for her. The lack of an extra mouth only made their lives easier and there was no money for searching. Perhaps her mother secretly hoped that her daughter was in better circumstances. Since then, Janice realized that pretending to be an orphan is profitable. So you can get sympathy, food, and clothes instead of hunger and beatings, and she can hardly be blamed for that conclusion. Since discovering the truth about the difficult childhood, the motive has become clearer. No one could have imagined the extent to which a traumatized and possibly mentally unstable child would be adopted by the Maggot family. In telling Gwen about her difficult life and the imminent lack of payments and housing, Janice had absolutely counted on an invitation to stay at her friend's house. She was used to playing on sympathy, was ready to pay for cleaning and looking after Louis, but the girl hardly expected that the Magov family would go so far as to adopt her. It opened up numerous childhood traumas. All her time in the Magov family had been spent observing the normal lives of other children, longing for such a life, feeling her own inferiority, abandonment, and carefully constructed psychological defense mechanisms. She was used to surviving and knew well how to do it, and suddenly she had it all. Everything she would ever dreamed of having. Never seeing enough care and love from her relatives, she did not know how to accept such care and did not understand how one could feel well-being. In her new family, it became difficult for her to accept kindness as something natural. She was constantly looking for a catch. She experienced the usual fear for the future, but did not find it reflected in reality. The care and love her adopted daughter received were filtered through her own experiences and emotional wounds. Instead of reassurance, Janice felt tension. She was not sure how to be a daughter, but she knew how to be a hired employee. Within the time limit, she told herself what was going on. This house really wanted a free worker, not a daughter. Everyone was just acting nice and enjoying how kind they were. 
They became angry and wanted to get back at the people who treated them like a lost dog. Janice became more angry with her family the better they treated her. She really felt like an alien and was envious of Lala and Gwen. People who could not handle these feelings turned love and care into things that made people afraid and angry. She got angry and frustrated, and she felt even less smart and understood. Because of this skewed view, she wanted to get back at the people she thought had lied to her and broken her trust. A lot of research in the field of child psychology shows how important it is for kids who have been through hard times and mental trauma to get psychological support, especially during the adoption process. But sadly, no one guessed about Janice's past and the terrible things that had happened to her emotionally. The M. Good family's wish to help the girl who had lost her parents turned into a nightmare. The brutal and unfixable killings of Gwen and Lewis took place in a private graveyard on December 20, 2021. Over 1,000 people came to the funeral and all said how sorry they were. In a twist of fate, Janice and Merlin found themselves facing distinct trials, yet the outcome remained identical. Both were given a harsh sentence of 32 years in prison with no chance of parole. This verdict cast a long shadow over their futures ensuring their release would only occur when they were well into their fifties. The Magad family, profoundly affected by a heinous crime, would never be the same again. The perpetrators, despite committing an unforgivable act, received the harshest punishment imaginable. In August 2022, the couple opened a restaurant as a tribute to their departed children. The very essence of the eatery is a reflection of Gwen and Louis' tastes and preferences. Every dish served carries the spirit of their children, a culinary homage to their memory. The restaurant stands as a testament to the enduring love and determination of parents who turned tragedy into a source of inspiration. Cruz and her wife did not merely cope with the loss. They transformed their pain into purpose. The decision to start a restaurant was not solely a business venture. It was a profound commitment to honoring the lives of Gwen and Louis. Every plate served as a culinary expression of love, a tangible connection to the departed souls. Beyond the confines of the restaurant, Cruz and her wife are actively engaged in seeking solace and healing. Their journey through treatment signifies a resilient pursuit of healing, a testament to the indomitable human spirit that refuses to be broken by tragedy. This couple's story is not just about personal healing. It is a poignant narrative of resilience and a defiant stand against despair. In using their restaurant as a vessel for commemoration, they have turned their pain into a force for good. Through this culinary tribute, they ensure that the memory of Gwen and Lewis endures not just as victims of a senseless crime, but as inspirations for a community rallying against adversity.